Do you want to find out what the experts in distilled spirits businesses have to say about managing and operating a distillery? Well, you should probably check out the Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville. It's a six-course online program taught in part by real corporate fellows, meaning that you're getting real experience from real experts at the most renowned distilleries, companies, and startups in the distilling industry. We're talking leaders from Brown Foreman, Jack Daniels, and more. So get enrolled into this fully online program at uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. You know, after our Meltdown Ice Press video went viral on TikTok and Instagram, every person that comes over to my house, they want to see it in action. So I put on a block of ice, put the top on it, and you watch the melted water drip down the groove channels and you end up with a perfect sphere. Stunning is easily the best word to describe it. Go get one of your own at MeltdownIce.com. If you're looking to upgrade your sleep, do it today with a Bear mattress. You're guaranteed to get the proper back support, pressure relief, and comfort or your money back. Every Bear mattress is proudly made in the USA and comes with two free pillows. Try the top-rated Bear mattress risk-free for 100 nights. You can learn more at BearMattress.com slash bourbon. That's B-E-A-R mattress.com slash bourbon. Are you too busy to drink your own bourbon? Do you not? Can you not find the right barrels? I'm your guy. I'm your guy. I will do the. I will do the drinking for you. This is episode 294 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start today's podcast, talking to Ryan Maloney of Julio's, here's your weekly bourbon news update. Japanese whiskey is taking a page out of the bourbon playbook, and the Japan Spirits and Liquors Makers Association has issued new guidelines on the production and labeling of Japanese whiskey to offer greater transparency across the category. The new production standards stipulate that malt must always be used in the making of Japanese whiskey, but other grains can also be used. Water used in Japanese whiskey must come from Japan. Fermentation and distillation should be done at a distillery in Japan. And distillation must be no more than 95% ABV. Maturation should take place in wooden barrels with a maximum capacity of 700 liters, which is around 185 gallons. Japanese whiskey must be matured in Japan for at least three years. And bottling must take place in Japan as well at a minimum strength of 40% ABV. But here's the difference. Caramel coloring still can be used. These go into effect starting April 21st, and producers have until March 31st, 2024, to adhere to the new guidelines. The Kentucky Distillers Association, or also known as the KDA, is calling for a modernization of tourism rules. After visitor numbers to the state's bourbon distilleries plummeted 66% in 2020, which is the first decline in 21 years with only 587,000 tours, versus the 2019 record of 1.7 million. The KDA is supporting a number of bills, which includes House Bill 415, which streamlines direct-to-consumer shipping, Senate Bill 67, which will allow distilleries to have cocktails to go, and Senate Bill 108, which will provide restaurants and hotels with an alcohol license to sell private barrel selection bottles to their customers. Now, with more news with shipping, it's another big setback as a U.S. federal appeals court ruled that a Florida wine shop cannot ship wine to customers in Missouri, even though Missouri stores can. The case of Sarasota Wine Markets versus Schmidt seems to directly contradict the 2019 Supreme Court ruling that said states could not discriminate against out-of-state wine retailers. Judge James B. Loken ruled against the Sarasota Wine Market and said that Florida store was not challenging the state's resident requirement, but instead was attacking the three-tier system. In effect, the Florida store was not required to buy its wines from Missouri wholesalers, as Missouri stores are. In another anti-shipping development, the Tennessee legislature is considering a bill that would prevent wineries from using fulfillment houses to actually ship its wines to its residents. All in all, this could possibly be the worst week for shipping, and it comes at a particularly bad time as consumers nationwide during the pandemic are ordering a lot more things online. Brown Foreman is embarking on a $95 million distillery expansion, and it's going to take around two years to complete. It will include doubling the amount of fermenters, adding column still capacity and mash cookers, improving the grain handling and byproducts, and it's going to also include a green space for a tree nursery, 
plus a modernized workspace for employees and a lot more. So you can expect a lot more bourbon coming now in our future. So moving on to bourbon release news. Maker's Mark is releasing the 2021 limited release FAE-01, which is a part of their wood finishing series. As a Maker's Mark first, the 10 virgin French oak staves were seared on one side and left the other side raw, leaving them in the barrel for nine weeks to enhance the flavor. It's bottled at cash strength, which is 110.6, and will have a price tag of around $60. Now for today's podcast, there's a few OGs in the world of whiskey, and one of the most notable names is Ryan Maloney. You may not have heard of that name, but you probably have most certainly heard of his store in Massachusetts called Julio's, or maybe even the famous picks that have been done by the Lock and Key Society there. Ryan gives us a trip down memory lane when private barrel selections were abundant and limited releases, well, they weren't so limited. As the game continually changes for retailers, Ryan talks about how they have to continually shift focus to always keep their customers excited. Barrel Craft Spirits is always setting the bar for some of the best blends on the market, using stocks and barrels from around the world. And you can get your hands on some right now without leaving your house. Go to BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. With that, enjoy today's podcast, and here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Parker Newman. Newman. Parker Newman writes me on fredminnick.com. I've been buying vintage spirits going back to Prohibition for investment purposes. I have no plans to sell them in the immediate future, but want to make sure I store them properly. Do you have any advice on the best way to store them? Type of chest or such. Thanks. So, Parker, I've written about this a lot for, you know, magazines, and I've been, you know, I've talked about this on radio shows in the past. And there's a lot that goes into this. And there's also not a lot that goes into this. The A lot, the meaning the complicated part that goes into this is before you bought them. Like, you got to be able to validate how these things were stored. And if the label looks bruised up, if the label looks like it's been, you know, thrown across the room a couple times and maybe, you know, a toddler got it and put it in its dadgum ball pit and, you know, ripped off a little bit of it, chances are it wasn't stored the best. Now, that's not always true. I've often opened up some really rare stuff that have beat up labels and it was just fine. But listen, if you were buying for investment purposes, Make sure the label is intact. If you're buying for consumption, look, enjoy it, you know, and I, I hope it's great. But there's also like a lot of other measures. Like there are things like um, the cork. If you see little little pieces of cork flecking off and it's just got a little bit of a micro, you know, micro inch just kind of popped up, you know, could be a mouse got in there, was clawing at it to try and eat it. Um, if you see something that there's a screw cap, there was a screw cap one. Like I stay away from screw caps because, uh, from that time frame, they would use, you know, an adhesive and the, the alcohol would pull that adhesive down. So investing in prohibition era stuff is risky. I guess that's what I'm getting at. But if you are going to do that and you are going to store them, the best advice I can give you is... Uh, a climate controlled area that's absolutely dark, no sunlight, no light anywhere near it at all, room temperature, and not over humid. You know, so the humidity levels need to be need to be similar to wine. And you need to go in and check on it every now and then. You want to, if you have cork bottles, you want to make sure that uh, you know about every six months you go in and like lift, tilt it up and down. So there's a so the cork doesn't dry out, so it's a little wet every now and then. So uh, there is a lot to it, but there's also not a lot to it. But I think the biggest the biggest piece to the whole investment puzzle is knowing what you're buying and being very cautious about what you're buying. Because I've said many times one of the most overrated things that you uh, that we can drink is prohibition era whiskey because the bottles that Uh, are still around today are around because people passed on them year after year after year after year after year. Now you do find some some gems out there and they're fantastic but you find more of the vintage gems from 1940 to 1970. That's where the sweet spot is for the collecting of vintage spirits. The prohibition time frame it's one of the greatest crapshoots in all of whiskey. 
And that's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you have an idea for Above the Char, hit me up like Parker Newman. Newman. On fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. Just click the contact button and submit your idea. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to an episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. The whole team here today talking to another aspect that we get inside of the bourbon industry. And we've had retailers on the show before, and we've talked about different facets of whether it's retail or whether it's barrel picks or how do you satisfy allocated bourbons. And I'm really excited to bring on our guest today because Fred and and Ryan, we know we've been talking before this, like I actually have been to the store. I've, I've known about this for a long, long time. And Fred, you've got a, a, a past relationship with, mm-hmm. with our guest today as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, iconic barrel picks, you know, an OG retailer. And I'd say, you know, we hear a lot of independent retailers getting like kind of snubbed out of, uh, of the game in the last few years. And I think our guest is, is like reached that kind of status where, uh, or at least I hope he has that no bourbon distiller, you know, chooses a big box store or some celebrity over over his like picks because he is uh, iconic in the bourbon game. For sure. Yeah. And, and Ryan, what have you known about Julio's Liquors in your history? Man, you are the person that introduced me because as you were talking about in the before the show, you had worked up there and uh, we get some barrel picks. And so I had a few barrel picks with you and then also found out about them through Reed and Emerald. You know, I think. Did they do some stuff with Julio's, you know, a lot of their picks as well? Uh, oh, yeah. 1780MB so has, has a connection. Anytime Reed and Emerald are behind it, you know, it's there's something special. So, uh, and then, yeah, I was watching, it was funny, I was watching your commercial before this on your website, and I loved your line. It was like, we're like, we don't claim to be the best beer store. People say that we are the best beer store. And I was like, <laughs> that's a incredible line. I love that. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. So I, I think uh, it's going to be a good way to, to segue and enter into this. So today on the show, we have Ryan Maloney. He is the owner of Julio's Liquors up in Massachusetts. So Ryan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks a lot. I'm listening to you guys and I'm like, wow, this that that store sounds incredible. I'll have to go there. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, you're talking about me. And, it's like, <laughs> and our store, and I'm like, oh, okay. I got a lot to live up to now. Well, you know, it's funny. Like I want to kind of start off with a... And, and, Actually, I'll start up the story after we do our icebreaker here. So I think it's always fun to do an icebreaker and let's kind of like get it going here. So Ryan, this question's for you. Okay. So carnival food, you know, you're, you're going there and you've got footlong corn dogs, there's funnel cakes. What's your go-to carnival food that you can't resist? Okay. So I don't know if this, if this qualifies, but uh, up here we have like, uh, we have the Woodstock Fair and there is uh, the Pork Palace makes these incredible sandwiches. And every t- year that my family goes there, I, that, that's the one thing I have to have. So I don't know if that if that's what you would consider like carnival food, um, but that's like the one thing. If, they're, if they are grilling something or they are barbecuing something, I have to go to that stand. And it could be the worst looking stand in the world. And people are like, I, did you get your shots before you ate that? Uh, it doesn't matter. I, it, that's the that's my downfall. It comes with a side of Lipitor, you know. And yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. I, I want to go to this Pork Palace. That's an incredible name. I love I know. all forms of pork. <laughs> it, it's it, it was it was really good, and they used to have like they used to sell their seasoning, and I I'd, I'd be at home trying to like still not the same. And my wife would be like, "Your grill's not dirty enough." <laughs> <laughs> Probably Kinda fair like, point. <laughs> yeah, like a cast iron. Like you yeah, just never you know. get it clean. That's right. <laughs> I would say I, I'm a big fan of uh, deep fried Oreos. Ryan or Fred, Ooh. you got any other ones? Uh, I'm pretty basic standard. Got to do a funnel cake and like just have powdered sugar cover my whole body. And like, and you just find it like everywhere throughout the day. Like, how did it get here? You know, I don't know. <laughs> but funnel cakes, man, they're so good. A corn dog will stop me dead in my tracks and make my fat ass go on over there and get it and slather it with ketchup or mustard and i'll tell you it's it's caused me some problems in the past in, in in the bourbon industry actually the uh for the kentucky bourbon festival i had i went to the little little fair area well i got a corn dog from one of them 
And, you know, I'm starting to feel my tummy rumble a little bit as I'm getting my suit on to go to the bourbon gala. Then I get in line and I'm like, oh, <laughs> and I can feel myself about to like hurl while I'm standing in line to get into the bourbon gala. And I'm like, oh, I got this. I'll just get a bourbon in me. I go inside. I greet Parker Beam and I'm like, oh, my God. And I know it's about to come and I'm not going to be in the freaking bourbon gala hurling and everyone's going to be like, oh, my God, look, Fred Phoenix in there. He drank too much. I sprinted. I sprinted out of the bourbon gala. And I ended up hurling like in a ditch. And thank God nobody really saw me. But uh, if you did see me, um, that I think that was 2011 or something like that. But that was like, uh, that put me on pause for a corn dog for a little bit. But now... I'm back on the train. Oh man, <laughs> that's great. So now we'll we'll kind of kick it off into the the real meat of the show, if you will. Um, that's what so, we we're talking about, wasn't it? Me? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we'll just talk about carnival food the entire time. So so kind of rolling back to my story here. So I used to work for a company in uh, called EMC. It's really really big in Northeast and Massachusetts area, and I would have to go up to Marlboro. And if, as if you ever go up there, everything ends with some sort of borough at the end of it. So you've got like North. We're in the boroughs. Bur yes, there's, there's boroughs everywhere. And I remember this is like 2013, 2011, maybe, I don't know, 2012 kind of time frame. And my bourbon journey, I was really just starting to get into it. The bug started biting me and people were like, you should probably go to this place up here. And it, I think that's probably a, a learning curve that everybody has when they see it, like, is it Julio's or is it Julio's? <laughs> and so we are, we are just like that other very small wine company, uh, Ernest and Julio Gallo. And yeah. it, it, you know, it was always, it was always funny because it was never a problem until probably in like, I was probably saying in the two thousands or a little bit before that, that people weren't sure mm -hmm. it's Italian. So it is, it is, it's the hard J. There you go. Just like we sell hard liquor. It's hard J. It's so an easy way to remember it. Remember. But I remember going up there and this was at a time when like private barrel picks were starting to like something that I was being, you know, gravitating towards and everything like that. And I ended up going to the store probably like three or four times during my, my time that I was up there. And one time really stuck out to me because I brought home a Bernheim wheat barrel selection that said NCF on it or UCF. It said UCF. 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 Yeah, it was uh, unchill filtered. And I remember I held on to that bottle for probably like four or five years, just like taking sip by sip because I knew that those days were never going to come of being able to find a barrel pick like that ever again. That's a really interesting, actually, that is a, um, that barrel pick in itself is sort of a fun sort of thing. So we were actually, I think we were one of the, if, if not responsible, uh, one of the first people that really helped um, Heaven Hill start their barrel program. So I would pick uh, Craig and, and Parker. I would go pick barrels with Craig and Parker. And of course, Randall Bird, who is the, sort of the unsung hero of our barrel picks that a lot of people don't know, him and I uh, traveled together because I always find it's, it's always good to have somebody whose palate you trust right next to you. Cause you might be, ha you know, you're traveling to Kentucky. You may have an off day period. So you always want that checks and balances to make sure you're both sort of uh, uh, tasting the same thing. So we used to, um, I had been bugging Parker to let me pick a Bernheim wheat whiskey. You know, bourbon was just started getting like, everybody was talking about bourbon and, and everything like that. And I'm like, man, I really want to pick one of those. The, I want to pick the Bernheim wheat whiskey. I think that would be really interesting. And Parker was like, Ryan, they, they, they all taste the same. They, I, he says, you really, you know, the barrels are very, very consistent. You won't find it. I said, I said, Park, if you let me in there, I'll find some barrels. And I said, but the other thing is I, I would like to do it unchill filtered and I would like to do it cast strength. So he, he's like, no, we're not ready for that and stuff like that. So I, I think it had been several times and he finally said, yes. He said, but I won't let you do it cast strength. I'll let you do it unchill filtered. And the U.S. the uh, unchill filter. That's another story. I'll get into that later. How why why we're unchill filtered. Um, so he, he let me do it. And that barrel that you have, we've done, we did actually uh, several of them were fantastic. And I always laugh because I think one of Parker's probably most sought after and 
uh, uh, that people f- try to find of the heritage is the wheat whiskey. Yep. Which, by the way, I will point out, is unchill filtered and cast strength. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I saw him. I said, uh, "Really, really? Yeah, you just try so, to take take your uh, take all your good ideas and run with them." I don't care as long as I got one. That was the, you know, that's the whole point of like a lot of the stuff that we've done over the years. It really wasn't, um, we always were trying to like, throughout everything we've done, we've always tried to push that envelope. No matter how little we could push it, we still wanted to push it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that came up with, in, a, in a lot of different ways. That came up to micro batching. That came up, you know, with uh, trying to get stuff that was on chill filtered uh, when it wasn't, uh, when it wasn't before. So that, that just led all into that stuff. But that was part of the thing is that convincing people that what we were doing was going to be good for the whole brand. And that was always our goal. Our goal was never to have Julio's or Lock and Key Society, which is what we pick under had the best had the best picks but our our thing was always a partnership with the distilleries to shine the spotlight on products that they really didn't know they needed to tell people about you actually brought up a a, a good little anecdote there that I had wanted to bring up as well because we know Julio's and I've seen Lock and Key but I didn't know like how the two intermingled so um we, we decided not to, because there was several different reasons, but we, we, we wanted Lock and Key Society because it was, Lock and Key Society itself started as people that were, and, and Fred knows this from the early, from the, especially the early days, you had guys that we would always into bourbon. My dad always had a really great bourbon selection and whiskey in general. But what, what originally started happening is when I was doing the barrel picks and I was doing all this other stuff at the very beginning, I had people that were coming in the store and they had these groups and they'd be like four or five guys. And they're like, oh, we meet in my garage every Tuesday and everybody brings a bottle. And all of a sudden I realized I got, wait a minute, I got three guys over here. I got five guys over here. I got 10 guys over there and they're all doing this type of thing. I said, wouldn't it be really cool if I could bring all of those people together? And how do I get them to all try stuff? And that's where the Lock and Key Society sort of um, started. And then because of that, and there was group picks and there's all, all sorts of stuff, we, you know, I, of course, have to have um, the final control. And, you know, my, some of my early picks do say Julio's Liquors. They went to the Lock and Key Society because that was going to become a very focused, um, a, a very focused project that we wanted to continue and even now, what we'll do is we actually have a, uh, a product in right now. We have a 1792 foolproof in store that says Julio's Liquors. We'll tell people, we didn't pick that barrel. Because of COVID, the only way for us to get a barrel of foolproof was to let the distillery pick it. So it was either that or not get a foolproof barrel this year. And f- up in the Northeast, foolproof, ba- foolproof period is very difficult to get. So I wasn't going to l- let that go. I said, fine, you guys pick it. Just put Julio's Liquors on it. So, because everybody always asks, well, why does this one say Julia's Liquors? And they can say, because we didn't pick it. We're very upfront about what we do and what is what else is done. And that's really, at the end of the day, you need to know all of that knowledge base the, for the consumer. Mm, sure. So, I kind of want to roll back a few years here. At what point did you realize that barrel picks are, happen to just be something that you all could carve a niche out of? Because you all were doing it way before a lot of other stores in the country and even necessarily in Kentucky were getting into it. And you were trying to get barrels from all kinds of places. So, um, my, uh, I have a friend of mine who loves because I tell this story cause it gives him credit for it. But originally I had a friend that worked for Sazerac who, uh, called me up and said, Hey, do you want to come down to Kentucky? They're bottling rain vodka. And I'd like you to see the process of them bottling rain vodka. And I said, so you want me to fly to Kentucky to watch them put a clear liquid in a clear bottle? And he said, yes. And he goes, well, now that you said that, that does sound sort of stupid though, doesn't it? And I go, yeah. Well, I said, is there anything else? Like I, I want to do barrels and that's something I had been looking into actually doing it. I said, do you like, could we do, could I watch them do um, bourbon? You know, they had some great bourbons down there and I, I was interested in that. And I said, maybe even, could I even get a barrel of one and then bottle it up? He goes, I don't know, let me see. He says, yeah, we just tried, you know, he came back to me. He said, we, we just started this 
saw a project that we were going to do and there's not going to be many people in it. And, you know, this was like, we're I mean, really just started. So I don't know if we were in the, we had to have been in like the first five anyways of people doing um, that type of stuff down there. So uh, really cool. I got to, you know, I got to work with, you know, with Chris Comstock. I, I got to work with uh, Truman Cox and, and uh, more importantly, I, I, I got to work with Elmer T. Lee which was, um, which was really cool because, uh, you know, and I get to work with Obi. Now, Obi was a guy, I don't know, Fred may, may know Obi. Obi was a guy that worked in the Rick houses and he would be the one pulling down the barrels because it wasn't really set up the way it is now. Yeah. And he would be, and the first time I came there, he said, I never met anybody from, from Massachusetts before. <laughs> and I go, what? And I never met anybody from Massachusetts. And you know, it really was the first time people were coming down to the distillery to actually working on picking barrels and doing, this was a whole new, a whole new world for everybody going on. Uh, because, but we were all very excited about it because it was just, it was something different that we could offer. It was something that we could put our, uh, not only put our name on, but put our taste buds behind it too. You know, I, I, have, I had worked in wine. I have, I had blended wine and stuff like that. I have done all that stuff and I've always been interested in whiskey and I, and it just made me hone that skill even further. Did you pick a Van Winkle? I did. Do you remember, was that the first barrel that you did? Um, you know, the funny part, I think, I think we did, I want to say it was probably Buffalo Trace and Eagle Rare. And then, um, we did Weller's and if you remember Weller Centennials, Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was doing Weller Centennials that were 13 and 14 years old, unchill filtered. And, and so th those things were great. And I, and I remember the first time, um, so we started doing those. We did some, uh, we did some Van Winkle 12s. We did some 15s. Uh, I think that was the, we, we stuck, I think with the 12 and the 15s when we were doing it. Um, yeah. Cause nobody wanted 20 or 23s back then. It's too expensive, especially a whole barrel. <laughs> yeah. Well, no one was buying it. How are you going to sell it? That was, I mean, that, that's the other part about this. How are, you, how are you going to sell it? One of the conversations that I had had with, 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 with Elmer and uh, we were picking, I was actually picking barrels one day uh, with him. We, and I, 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 was, I was very fortunate. I got to do that quite a bit. We were actually um, talking about barrel when we were actually picking out barrels. And I had actually turned away one of the uh, the the Van Winkles. I said it's it's green, and I don't like it. Uh, Elmo tried it and go, yeah, you're right. And he said, did, and, and he had asked Obi, hey, Obi, did did uh, did Julian come down and pick this? Now, it depends on what time of the day. It was no one's fault. It just happened to be a green barrel, and so that got Elmer and I talking about the whole fact of aging of aged whiskey, which is now becoming a bigger deal. But him and I were, were discussing, he goes, Ryan, look at what I pick for Blanton's. And he says, that is anywhere usually between eight and 10 years old. He said, for us in this distillery, that is our sweet spot. That is where our, our whiskey shows the best. He said, ah, you know, they, they want to buy this stuff that's, you know, that's 15, 20 years old. He's like, it's like a piece of wood, you know, and, um, and it's hard. It, it, and they, they are there. Those 15s, 20s, and 23s are there. But it's a lot more of a search and it's a lot. And if you notice, a lot of they're not single barrels. They have to blend them together because, you know, um, other than that, it's like sucking. If you're not careful, it's like sucking on a church pew. <laughs> <laughs> it's one dimensional and that's it. That's and, a new and, one. Yeah. Okay, like, oh, listen, there's, there's a lot of uh, descriptors for wood sucking on a church pew. <laughs> well, here's my best, uh, Fred. This is what I usually say. It's uh, like, you know, when you get up to a certain point, you'd be better off taking grain alcohol, puring, pouring it on a church pew and sucking it. Cause that's about the, <laughs> the amount of flavor you're going to get. How many people sat on that church pew before you started sucking? Well, it? you know, that all depends, <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, but it's true. We actually did, uh, you guys may have tried some of the ones, uh, we get to try some of the ones that were coming out of the, uh, uh, the museum that were 42 and 43 years old, the Thompson's. Yes. Yeah. Thompson Reserve. Yeah. It yeah, was, yeah. it had, the nose was incredible, yes. but oh, it was really hard to drink. Turned to mint. So bitter. It was, it turned to grandma's cedar chest and mint. And it's, and it's, it's really cool because you're drinking a piece of history. But it tastes, but like who terrible. would drink one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, but that's, a, it, that's the outer, outer limit. But, you know, uh, through the years, we've, we've actually passed on a lot of really cool stuff because, we felt that the barrels that we were picking had had gone past that point 
of being interesting and having some depth to them to being one dimensional. So how, I mean, going to a barrel pick now must just suck for you. Like, like, like compared to like these early stories, I mean, when we go, there's three barrels and they're like, how fast can we get you out of here? And, you know, and you're there rummaging through the warehouse with Elmer T. Lee. And I mean, that's, in, well, the, that's the, incredible. But the, but the thing is, is that, you know, um, Randall and I go down and they think that's going to be, you know, cause everybody likes to pontificate of, of when they're picking a barrel because it is for, for, for everybody. It, it is one of those type of things where it's, you're getting to pick a barrel. I mean, that's pretty damn cool. Yeah. And I agree with them. It's pretty damn cool. But when you get so many people in the room, they all want to tell you about what they're tasting and what they're picking. And that's why barrel picks can take forever. I did one time with a barrel pick with 18 people and it was like herding cats. And I swear <laughs> to God, I would Gosh. never do it again. Uh, but, but, you know, but that's it. Randall and I will walk in there. We'll go through everything. Um, we'll make our barrel picks. We don't even talk to each other anymore. We'll, we'll make our barrel picks almost by sign language and, and, and we're done. But the only thing that we do that we do is we won't take everything that's given to us. It, we'll ask for other samples. We'll ask if something could be sent to us. You know, um, it doesn't happen often because a lot of stuff is pre-picked. That's what, that's what happens when you have like power. You know, most of us are like, uh, you know, I don't have any power. Trust me. I'm married. I have very, very little power. Here's two <laughs> barrels. Here's two barrels. You can pick mm -hmm. half of one. Okay. We'll, we'll take that one. You know, it's just, it, it is crazy though, how it's changed so much. I remember four roses would bring out 20 barrels. Like now, oh, yeah. now you make it four, you know, it's just so different. We usually get, I mean, because of the recipes, um, Mindy's really good for, I think for most people, you usually get between six, six and nine for mo most of the time. Cause they, they do really make a conscious effort to bring, especially she does, um, yeah, to try to bring great. out, yeah, maybe try awesome. to bring out one of each recipe so that you're at least, you're at least, um, you're at least doing that. Yeah. But there, okay. Cause you know, Fred and, and, and Ryan, you go like, wow, you know, you've picked some great barrels and done some stuff. We have, but it's also knowing what not to take mm -hmm. more than what it is to take. And, 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 th and that's part of it. And it's not that you can't sell it. It's just, what does that do to your reputation? Uh, uh, we did some stuff with Tre Trey uh, Zoller, who's a great guy. And w w he had gotten some um, Stetzel Weller barrels and he invited uh, me and Randall down to go uh, take, uh, pick some barrels. And we did, and he was, you know, he was blending stuff. We were looking at, uh, straight barrels. And we, we picked, I think like, I want to say two or three. I, I can't remember. Um, we picked like two or three. And when we went back, we're like, we're done. Could we have sold another one? Absolutely. It would have sold. I wouldn't even have to have tried to sell it. It would have sold automatically, but that would have been the last barrel I sold because, uh, your reputation is as good as the last thing. I'm not saying everybody's going to like everything we pick, but it will be, it will be, uh, it will be quality. Oh, yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, can you think of like over the years? Because uh, gosh, I mean, talking about picking Stitzel Weller barrels, like oh, that's a that's got to be a tough gig. You know, are there other? <laughs> it was like it was like Super Bowl week. I think if I remember, it was like Super Bowl weekend. And like everybody's getting psyched, and I'm jumping on a plane in the middle, you know, in the middle of February to go down to, you know, down to Stetzel Weller. And if you remember, that was none of that stuff was open. I mean, nothing was happening there at the time. There was only basically storage. That was an eerie thing too. We, we got to walk around and check everything out. And it really was like everybody had put their hammer down and walked away. It, 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 just like there was still candy wrapper on the floor. It just like everybody just left. And uh, so you're like, yeah, it's cool. But it's also in another way, it's, it's sort of eerie uh, when you're doing stuff, especially at like at that place at that time. Probably could have opened up Stitzel Weller ghost tours if they were to. They could have, have absolutely. The except you couldn't walk on some of the parts. Of uh, Randall was about six seven. Uh, uh, we couldn't take. We can go into some parts because he'd probably fall through the floor. <laughs> <laughs> well, then yeah. it becomes an obstacle course too. And that's not the prettiest property by any means. You know, I mean, no, bullets, it's very industrial. Bullet's done a decent job of trying to dress it up, but yeah, it's very industrial. Yeah. Somebody told me that uh, I think it was they actually used that in uh, that property is maybe somebody can uh that will listen to your show can stream up but so I, I was i was told that some they had used that property for stripes and that was the czechoslovakia <laughs> what well, i was gonna say uh, it looked like a board on prison uh, camp or whatever it was well beam, beam was used uh in stripes uh 
you know, they use, they did use some distilleries. I don't know if Stitzel Willer was used. Yeah, I don't know. No. That's why somebody had told me that. I know wondering. Beam was. It could have. I'm going to tell you right now, looking uh, the way it looked, it definitely could have. Yeah. But that's, you know, uh, th- that's the other thing. I mean, you know, we get new things. We try to do new things all the time. Um, but it's not only it's not only what you pick, it's what you don't pick. Mm. So what are your new things right now? Yeah, what do you think like is on the forefront of barrel picks and like what what's really exciting to you? Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in 2016 as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes, delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53-gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. You can find all spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, always drink responsibly. Yeah, what do you think like is on the forefront of barrel picks and like what what's really exciting to you? It's always about what the right questions to ask. And Fred knows this immediately because he interviews so many people. It's always what what the right question is. We're walking around in in, in Buffalo Trace and we're like, wow, this is where they're bottling everything. How how many barrels does that hopper hold? <laughs> and they're like, two. And like, two, huh? Huh. So that's what we got. We started doing micro batching. So um, we actually were taking barrels and putting barrels together to create something that was not a single barrel, but was the smallest small batch you could possibly get. So that was that was one of those type of things. So we've always like looking for different things, and we're looking for partners who are who are, are, are suckers who are willing to let us go that <laughs> extra, do that extra do that extra step. And sometimes they don't know what they got themselves into. Uh, we did some. We did actually a really cool thing with. Uh, with Sagamore. Now, Sagamore, as, uh, as you guys know, they are sourcing their whiskey. They're ready to go online. They're not far, far behind that. But they are, uh, they are sourcing stuff from, um, uh, from MGP. And they have uh, some really great products sitting in their warehouse. And, and they do the, the 95.5, all right? But they also have a proprietary blend that, that, they, that they're using from MGP. So, we went and said, we would like to do something with that. We would like to make a mixture of those, a blending of those, of those type of things. So we took two barrels and blended those together, then took another two barrels and blended those together, and then took those two uh, micro batches and blended those together. So two barrels, two barrels, and then to one batch. So we put everything together um, on that, and that was called Arai 421, four to two to one. And that came out great because we were able to like take what they had and give that like sort of um, uh, spicy rye up front and with a, a more of a, we like to call a bourbon-esque finish. Mm-hmm. So it had a little bit of that sweeter tone finish. And it's a really great bourbon to get people into start to drink it. Uh, really great rye to get people uh, to start drinking that coming from bourbon. Um, I would imagine by, by doing that too, is you're able to satisfy a lot more of your customer demand. Because it's not like, oh, I got one barrel. Wait, we did four of them. So this <laughs> right. one person's got to get one of each. But instead, you're able to combine them, create a bigger release. Because, I mean, the way that just the industry's gone and the way consumer demand's gone, it's got to just be hard on you as a retailer to satisfy all your customers. But it's got to be quality. And that's, that was always the point, too. Even the micro batching, the, 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 what we came up with had to be better than the two barrels separately. Uh, a single barrel is a very unique thing. It, 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 it can stand on its own. And that's very difficult for a lot of things to do, which is why single barrels are not, everything is not a single barrel because it is, it is difficult to find one that just stands out so much that you want to just have that barrel of it. And that's why ble- the art of blending is really where a lot of this stuff, uh, popularity over the long term is the art of the blend, not of the art of the pick. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's a, a lesson I think that, I think everybody is finally starting to realize that. And it's been a long time coming that we've always been about trying to t- get people to understand it's the final product and it's the art of the blend rather than just one obscure barrel that just happens to taste unbelievable. 
Now, Ryan, I don't know if you have this, but uh, um, have you created your own private label yet, or is that in the works? There has been talks about mm -hmm. us doing some fun things. Uh, one of the things that I that one of the things that is in the works that I'm sort of talking about is a lot of people have a lot of people have uh, single barrels now. Mm -hmm. Who who picks them? Oh, they're from all over the place. Yeah, I but mean, who who picks the barrels? Some in some instances, it's the distillery. Now, the, the, everybody's they're great guys from you know from Har Harland to to you name it. They're 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 all very nice guys. But they're going to pick a barrel that's a solid barrel. They're going to pick something that also fits within their box. Um, they're not going to venture out, and I don't blame them. I wouldn't. I wouldn't either. So now you have like a lot of these uh, big stores, but you have also have. Not 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 so much small stores, but medium sized stores doing that. And the important question, not to ask if it's a single barrel or not. The more important question is, who's who picks them? Because you could get the luck, luck of a draw and, it, and it's good or not. But it took us a long time to develop a reputation um, for for picking uh, really good barrels. I, I would like to get into a thing where I could help people do that. Like if you have a store and you want something like they could, we would, we would do the picking for you. The special services of Brian. Yeah, sort of a, yeah. <laughs> or, or we can come out with a label that's, that's special service. Label. Are you like too that. busy to drink your own bourbon? Do you not, can you not find the right barrels? <laughs> I'm your guy. I'm your guy. I will do the, I will do the drinking for you. Are you whiffing on your picks, Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> but it would be a lock and key pick. You know, it would be a lock and key mm. pick for somebody, but at least you, like you're going in there. You're also knowing that once again, we're not going to, we, we, we couldn't afford to put anything on there that we didn't feel uh, was, was quality. Um, because now it's even a bigger problem. So we, we, we have talked about several different ways of, of either coming up with our own blends. Um, you know, I've worked with, um, we did a great one with, um, not bourbon, but compass box and, uh, oh, Aster, yeah. Aster, Aster and, uh, Daniel Fisher and I, and, and, um, Greg Glass and, and, and John Glazier put together rivals, which was Boston versus New York. Yeah. And uh that was a really that was a fun project to do. Uh it came out really great. Uh I'm very proud of that project. Mm -hmm. We're working on something right now with uh and I've done stuff with Brett at Binnie's and stuff. And we're working actually, it should be out this year. Um we're doing a uh, again, we we <clears throat> we got Sagamore to <laughs> agree. Um we have a uh Armagnac finished rye that I think mm -hmm. is everybody's gonna really, really like. So yeah, Fred, you're getting on the inside track on that. We, we, we have been looking at different ways to, to use what we've done in our knowledge base um, to help other people. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, you've seen it from Delilah's uh, to Liquor Barn, you know, people who have been doing this for a while uh, to, to include Kenny and Ryan. You know, eventually everybody, you know, wants to, you know, get their, their own brand going. And I think it just makes a lot of sense for you, Ryan. Especially with the the blending background that you all have developed, my question is: Are you going to, you know, are you going to jump in on a little bit of this this new wave of blend of straights? Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, rye and single malts and bourbons getting mixed together. We're even seeing rums and bourbons getting mixed together. And I think they're some of the most exciting products that are on the market to to include. Uh, you know, United, which these two gentlemen put together. So I think you've got some, you've got, you've got a lot, you, you know, a few, 10, 15 years ago when we were doing this, the cupboard was like this. Now it's like this. I mean, you could really play around with what's out there and what's trendy. Fred, the big thing is education. And, uh, you know, you guys do, do the podcast. So I, I do, a, I do a radio show and a podcast. The thing is about education. You, you have to get people to understand. Mm-hmm what you're actually putting together. And a lot of people go, oh, it's not bourbon. <laughs> That's not single malt. And, and it's like an affront to their it's e not KY. entire it's existence the that you've, you've, you've done the unspeakable and you've started to mingle things together. And it doesn't matter. Yeah. They're not even interested in how it tastes. They just, you know, uh, uh, you know, I had said something the other day is at the end of the day, really it's, it's, uh, it's about how it tastes and the price. Is the price worth what it tastes like? And how's the taste? And somebody says, I can't believe how, uh, how, what a bad statement that is. And I go, 
why? What else? Uh, just tell me what else is there. If they're following the laws and they're not, you know, they don't have like some sort of like, they're not throwing extra carcinogen in the whiskey. What, what, what else could there be but those two things? Is well, it's, it's about what the company stands for. And it's just like, I go, yup, it is. And you can take a ton of stands on that by not opening your wallet. But it's still, you still don't, if a guy's doing everything right and he's Mother Teresa of the bourbon world and his bourbon stinks, you're really going to buy it? I mean, it's Mother Teresa. Of, yeah, I mean, I you got at least well, maybe one bottle. <laughs> Fred, it'd be Fred. It'd be Fred. You buy one bottle for charity purposes. But I think that that's, you know, that, that part of the thing to start bringing, um, I think it's, I think it's going to take a little bit more baby steps. I mean, um, look at that. I just happened to have this here. Mm -hmm. Um, how, how convenient, how convenient. I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but that yeah. is, there we go. Um, that is a uh, privateer who, who makes rum up by us. Uh, mm -hmm. they're great. Uh, Maggie Campbell's doing unbelievable things she's there. Great. Right. Uh, Fred, you, you've, you've had to have met her. She's, she's fantastic. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So yeah. what we did is we said, I want a queen share, which is one of the rums that she does, uh, rums that she does. And I sent her, I sent her our 15 year old, uh, Knob Creek barrel that had just been emptied. And I said, could you put the rum in this, the queen share rum in this? And she did. And it's fantastic. And so I think the way, one of the ways that we can start getting people to understand the interaction of different things together is to do some finishings that people aren't necessarily. And we all know that the majority of rum is, is aged in bourbon gas anyways. But you want to get people to understand like what, what she's doing, what she's all about, what the rum, uh, what the bourbon barrel can actually do for the rum and what the final product tastes like. Again, it's an educational thing, but it's also one of those type of things where you're promoting, you're promoting two, two sides of that industry. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think uh, another interesting take on here is, you know, you talked about doing, working with Binnie's and, and working with um, Aster and everything like that. So what's your thought process behind collaborations with different stores? Is it to de-risk it an investment or is it, do you really see like power in numbers? I usually only work with people I really like. <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> but, 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 you know, but it is one of those type of things you get along and you, you know, it's, it's really interesting to do some stuff with people that have the same mindset that, that you do. Um, um, uh, but it's also, it's also can be, it can be fun. Sometimes it can be to, to, uh, make sure that whatever we come out with is spread across a couple different people and stuff like that. Uh, we just did the thing with, uh, Brett myself, Randall, and uh, Joe from Biddy's. Uh, we were up helping, um, got to be part with Dr. Don about uh, doing the blend of cast strength lot 40. So not, not a lot of people know about that. Only 50 cases came to the United States. But we basically helped with the blend for the entire country of Canada. Now, it's neat that we got it, but it's never, you know, it's not. It, it, I, I'm not going to be able to retire on the, on the 25 cases of the 50 that I got. And, and for, you know, for Brett at Benny's, that's a drop in the bucket. I mean, it's just not even going to, I don't think he can put a, 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 a case in every store, but it is something really cool to do. And, sure. uh, you know, if I have something like that in, in, in that, in that case, Dr. Don and I have been talking about doing something like that. And I sort of said, Hey, is, would it be okay if I approached Benny's on it? I'd really like Brett to come up here and do that. And he's like, yeah. And, and it was a great time. We had a great time doing it. And it's just somebody that like, I enjoy, I enjoy doing stuff with. And, um, and if the product came out and we got 150 cases of it, then Benny's going to take it in more of it. And I would have got my 50 and we would have been fine. As it stood, we only got 25 and 25, but that's, I'd rather have done that project for only 25 cases than not done it at all. For sure. It's awesome. And so I got kind of a, another question as we start wrapping this up here a little bit is, when you look at going back and basically having carte blanche to go and select whatever you want to the rise of bourbon popularity, to the rise of every other retailer in the nation now wanting to do barrel picks and you being on allocation and getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, how does that make you feel as somebody that has been there? And as Fred used to say, we took you to the dance. Wow, it's funny that Fred says that because my father said, uh, my father told me a long time ago is that it is about taking you to the dance, but it's also the same people you see on the way up will be the same people you see on the way down. It's good to have them with friends both ways. So, um, you know, there is been, there has been some of that, 
there were um, products made here in Massachusetts that we, if we hadn't gotten part of it, would never have taken off here. Uh, they got popular way, way later or whatever. But sometimes I think in the big r- rigmarole of everything that's going on, there is a little bit of that. It's, it, it's like, oh, okay, but remember, um, remember the guys when you couldn't move any of it, who took it and sat on it for six months to a year. Uh, people forget those times. People go like, well, why does, why does, uh, why does Ryan get, get to still do a pick of X? Because there are people that still remember that. Why does he get to do a barrel of X? He says, because when he was doing barrels of X, you didn't even know about it. And the distillery wanted to move it. And he was there doing it. Yeah, I think there's a, but, but Ryan, there's a lot of people who have, who've done that and had that same argument. But what I have noticed with you is that people are really loyal to Julio. So my question is, I mean, you got blackmailing these people. It's like, what's the deal here? Because they they, you're still getting barrel picks when other people in other states are not. This is true. I think it's always been, it's always been a, I've always looked at it as a partnership. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you do the partnership right, both of you want to do it again. You might not be completely happy. They might not be completely happy, but it works for both of you. And I think that's the the whole thing. I mean, I, I listen, I, I'll give uh, Drew down at Willet. Him and I have been doing stuff for years and I know he he's not doing something this year. I'm not calling him. I'm not bugging him about it. When he when he's ready to do it, um, we'll talk casually or uh, something. He says, "Hey, do you do you want to do you want to grab something?" From the get go with uh, with Drew, it's never been about what it said on the barrel. It always was about the bourbon, and I think I've I've made myself clear across the years doing stuff. It's always about the bourbon. It's not about what it says on the outside. And uh, like with Drew, guys were trying to cherry pick him for stuff, and I just said, Drew, I don't care. Like, you tell me. I, I, I come down here and I try. Let's say I try. Let's say I try 20 barrels. He knows all thousands of the barrels that he has. I'm only touching so many of them. I said, I said you show me. What, what do you think is tasting good? And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, I'm not looking for something. I'm, not, I'm looking for something that you think is good. And he would take me around and we'd try some stuff. I said, a lot of the early barrels that we were picking from like Willet were brown foreman barrels. They were fantastic. Now, if I had said to people they were brown foreman barrels, they wouldn't have touched them with a 10-foot pole because that's not what they were looking for. They were looking for old Stetzel Weller barrels. So they were looking for Bernheim barrels. That's what they were looking for. And I just never said anything. I said, just try it. And people bought it. And they're like, this is great. I can't believe how good this is. It's because it's about the bourbon. And at the end of the day, that's what it has to be about. You know, one of the things too that's happened, and I know Kenny wants to wrap up, but it's it's the it's the pressure that's applied to retailers to keep the allocated products in, to get the barrel picks. And as far as I know, you don't really play that game either. I mean, you you might buy an extra case of vodka here, but you're not you're not playing the uh, front loading on, say, a flavored whiskey and a vodka just to get a case of something. <laughs> wow, your code is so good. Um, <laughs> he, but, he, uh, must, um, he must have bought a lot of rain vodka, you know. That, <laughs> I, Sazerac's always been very good to us, but that is because that when something is needed or or when they're trying something, we, we will be there getting big and we'll try it. Um, our, that's also our relationship with our wholesaler. Uh, who up here hap- uh, happens happens to be uh, Horizon. We do a lot of stuff with them, and we, you know we've always kept we've always kept that up. And it's also the way I think part of it, to be honest with you, I think it's also the way we dole it out. We don't raise the price. Uh, we make a full margin. Don't get me wrong. I'm not giving anything away because I get so little of of a lot of this stuff. But we've come up with very innovative and very fair ways of. Uh, getting it to the consumer. Our whole card system, for instance, is one of those type of things that we've that we've uh, that we've used over the years. And it's about to change a little bit again, too, because because of what you're talking about, Fred, is some of these things getting harder and harder to get. And we want to make sure that our customer base is also is treated fairly uh, and correctly. But I think that's part of it. Is like we're not out for the quick dollar. Uh, Mm -hmm. we're not jacking stuff up. We're not making everybody really run through hoops and we're not doing the same thing to our customers that I see other people do. So like you're saying, some of the suppliers are making them do uh, a a lot to get 
what they get. We're, we're trying not to do that. We're trying to be as fair as possible. And guess what? We, we, we try to make it give the advantage to our everyday, to our customer. I, I can't tell you as a retailer, there's a, there's a whole different perspective here. And sometimes we get on this and, 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 uh, you know, I'm on a lot of like Facebook pages and I'll, I'll talk to anybody about, about stuff. But if you run into the store, walk up to the clerk and just say, like, you got any Blanton's? And they say, no. And you turn around and you walk right out. You're very likely not to get a Blanton's <laughs> ever. That's, ever. That's the, that's the way to do it, right? I mean, right, yeah, right. Everybody's it's, just waiting. To to be, you're waiting for that one person that doesn't know that they have something that's very difficult right now to get. And you say, oh, sure, there's a, there's a case out back. You want the whole case? They're waiting for that one person that sort of has that nivete that they, they don't even know what they got. So that's, that, that's not going to, you know, that, that type of, of thing is not really conducive to, to how, when you get so little of it, you want to make sure that your, your regular customers are, are taken care of. And we've, we've, set up, we've set up very fair systems to do. Is it perfect? No, but a very fair system to make sure that happens. Well, I mean, this has been fantastic. I think we've covered like how many different facets we've covered. I know, this is we've like way too future. much. We've covered the history. We've covered how you're dealing with allocations. Uh, I mean, I feel like we've just scratched the surface, so we're going to yeah. have to have you come back on the show at a, at a later Absolutely. day. And we had a little bit of breaking news in that there will be a lock and key uh, blend coming out to a store near, near you at some point. And cons- <laughs> some consulting <laughs> services as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, I have to, now I have to actually do work to make that happen. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. Uh, what's it take? A couple of business cards and a mailing it. address? Yeah, you can figure that part out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you sell that one to my wife. Then. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, you, everybody needs to be stretched a little bit thinner. I think that's yeah. how it works. Exactly. Well, Ryan, before we uh, kind of sign off here, give a, a chance for anybody that wants to know more about Julio's, more about Lock and Key. How do they follow you? How do they find you? Well, so juliosliquors.com is is the thing. We're on uh, Lock and Key is on Facebook, so you can check it out there. I try to do a little bit of. I, I'm on Instagram, and I try to. Um, I usually give people uh, uh, like like hints of stuff that's coming up. So you can follow me on Instagram at whiskey journeyman. No e in whiskey. Whiskey journeyman uh, on Instagram. So. Uh, Check that out because there's some really cool stuff that I'll, I I I saw it on like Fred where I, I I don't really tell you what's happening but you get clues. <laughs> well, Ryan, I do want to say thank you again for coming on the show today. As Thanks for having me. We scratched the surface. We've, we're going to have you back on because I feel like you bring a, a really interesting aspect into the retail market, into what people have grown accustomed to now with barrel selections, and that's becoming the the thing that people are chasing after. And it's no longer just always allocated products, but the fact that you've been doing this for so long and have a lot of established relationships, and I'm sure that you could guide a lot of people and lessons that Elmer taught you and selecting barrels and everything like that too. I've learned so much from everybody. And the day that you don't think you can learn something is the day you should get out of this because um, yeah. it's amazing what you, if you stop and listen to people, it's amazing what you can learn about this business. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that hour just flew by. I'm like, what? You know, I just, I want to hear more stories. You, you have <laughs> such good stories. We'll do the war story edition. How's that? <laughs> this is, the aspect of the retailer is one of those type of things that I do, I do think sometimes gets overlooked in this industry because we deal with everybody who's drinking the final product. Yep. You, you all are the front line. People say, uh, I always tell people it's not sold until they come back. Yep. Ooh, there you go. Put that trademark at the end of it. You want to hate that? Yeah, a lot of good Amen. one-liners. <laughs> <laughs> Usually they're dad jokes, but yes, I'll go with it. <laughs> it's okay. We got we got plenty of those to go around too. For sure. <laughs> well, Ryan, thank you again for coming on the show today. Make sure you follow Julio's and follow Ryan on Instagram as well as find the Facebook pages, but you can also follow Bourbon Pursuit wherever you get your podcasts as well as on all the socials as well. With that, I want to say thank you again for Ryan for coming back on and we'll see everybody next week. <laughs> <laughs>